Hi, my name is Jim Withy, and I'm the CEO of Gig Yeast. And today we're going to talk about yeast management in the brewery. So I basically break down yeast management in a craft brewery by the Holy Trinity. It's three steps. There's harvesting. Storage of the yeast. And then repitching them, including how do you know how much to repitch and different methods for it. So the first thing is about the time that you harvest. So if you're new to this, you might be wondering, when should I harvest my yeast? Well, if you leave your yeast uh, too long before you harvest it, you can start to lose some viability and activity. And in fact, even yeast left on the cone for too long can cause off flavors. On the other hand, Harvesting your yeast too soon can cause problems too. Uh, premature harvest can concentrate the older, denser yeast or even cause a stalled, slow fermentation. So what you wanna do is get your Goldilocks on, get right in that perfect bed, eat that perfect bed of porridge. All right, so when to get your grim rigor on? When do you harvest that yeast? Ideally, for your best consistent yield, you would have your beer fully attenuated and crashed to about 38 or 40 Fahrenheit for 24 hours. That's your best, best harvest for yield and viability. Lots of brewers do not crash their yeast for a number of reasons. So if your beer is fully attenuated and you can get that temp down below about 70, you can get a very good harvest. And a lot of brewers have good luck with this. Finally, in a pinch or depending on your process, if you're going cone to cone or you're top cropping, you can harvest yeast after attenuation has passed about 50%. Um, it's most often done with top cropping, but uh, you can also do it from a conical. And uh, the yeast will have very high activity, but you risk stalling the fermentation you took the yeast from. And you also risk selecting for, again, the older, denser, less active yeast. So here's some tips. Under good conditions, you can expect to harvest enough yeast for at least two batches of the same size. So if you have a 10 barrel fermenter, under good conditions, you should get out at least enough for a 20 barrel pitch. If your yeast is less flocculent, if you have something powdery like a half or a, or a wit yeast, or you're harvesting without cold crashing, you may have a reduced yield. Another tip is do not harvest after dry hopping. Your first option should always be to make another beer that's not dry hop during active fermentation. Harvest the yeast from that. And again, you have two to one. So you can have one go back into your pale ale and the other one goes to the dry hopped beer and goes down the drain afterwards. Many of my customers just can't make that work. And so what they do is it will harvest just before the dry hop. Um, if you can afford to lower the temperature to 60 to 65 just before dry hopping and harvest the yeast from the cone of a conical fermenter, you can still get biotransformation, you can get a better yield and healthier yeast. I just want to reiterate that Sometimes the best practice just doesn't work in your brewery. So just keep in mind a couple of general principles when you're making things work for you. The first one is yeast left for a long period of time in a conical will lose activity and viability. So try to get it within 24 to 48 hours after terminal. The second thing is that 
Harvesting from a conical before terminal gravity, it might result in some lower yields. Doesn't mean you can't repitch it, but uh, you may have less yeast. And again, you may be selecting for those denser, older yeast. Now I wanna turn to the vessel you're gonna harvest into. And uh, as everybody knows, they're called yeast brinks. I don't know why. <laughs> If anybody does, please email us immediately and tell us. I think it may have to do with Brink's armored trucks. But a yeast Brink is any vessel that you harvest and store yeast into between pitching. And harvesting and storing your yeast in a Brink has several advantages. It's been done for a long time and there's a reason for it. One of the main reasons is that when you brink your yeast, you can sample it and check it for cell density with a hemocytometer or microbial quality control and viability prior to pitching. So you know what you're getting before it goes in. Even if you're not doing those things, and a lot of successful brewers don't, it means you can harvest yeast into separate brinks each one can have the right amount for a pitch to one more brew, and it can be very convenient for repitching at a later date. So what kind of brinks are there? Well, a really simple and widely used cost-effective solution is just a keg. Most smaller breweries will use a five-gallon keg, a sixth there. All you need to do is take a couple lengths of polybraided tubing. One of them should be about a six foot length of high pressure tubing, usually, like I said, like polybraided uh, polyvinyl tubing. Uh, and you can use worm drive clamps or hose clamps of any kind to attach a hose barb to the uh, tubing and then attach it to the keg fitting. This hose will be used to harvest and repitch. The second connection to the keg is going to serve as a pressure relief while you're harvesting into it, and it's going to serve as a way for gas in to pressurize the brink when you're pitching. So the advantages of a simple keg that's unmodified are that it's affordable and it's simple. You have small gauge fittings. That's kind of a downside. Another downside is that it typically doesn't allow you to use your brewery hoses, which might be CIP'd and uh, sanitized on the day of harvest. And it's also really difficult to visually assess the cleanliness inside the keg because you have no entrance to it. You can also purchase a dedicated yeast brink and they have some advantages. The first one is they're going to have wide gauge ports, you know, inch and a half or maybe even larger that allow you to just transfer yeast without squeezing them through a narrow valve. The second thing is they typically will come with a four or six inch uh, TC port on the top, which also allows you to install a PRV for pressure relief. Uh, not only during harvesting, but during storage. And also it allows you to have easy inspection of it and you could put a CIP ball in there to clean it and sanitize it. So in our tips here, we're gonna talk about cone to cone. Uh, a lot of craft brewers do transfer cone to cone. And I just wanna go over, you know, what are the pluses and minuses of it? So cone to cone transfer, is basically, not basically, it is transferring yeast from one cone of a finished fermentation into the cone of another fermenter that you just transferred wort to. The good thing about it is you don't have a brink, so you don't have to clean and sanitize that brink. And the yeast is moved directly from one tank to another without any exposure to additional risk for contamination. So those parts are good.
The challenges are more, your brew schedule has to be very precise because you have to be brewing on the day you harvest. So that can be limiting for some people. And it's difficult to maintain consistent pitch rates. You can definitely do it. You can do it with either expensive equipment that will monitor uh, the yeast cell counts as it transfers to the tank, or you can do it with a lot of experience, just knowing, okay, I'm working with this strain. This is how much I transfer from the cone. But it takes practice and it's less flexible. Now let's get to talking about the harvest. So you should start the harvest the same way you start everything in your brewery, by cleaning. You want to clean and sanitize everything. So start by cleaning and sanitizing the number of brinks you'll need. And uh, you should always overshoot this a little bit because if you end up with more yeast and you don't have a sanitized brink sitting by, you're going to have to dump it. Typically, a 10 barrel fermenter might yield as much as 10 to 15 gallons. So three sixers or one half barrel. You want to attach a sight gauge to the clean drought hose and completely fill it with an appropriate sanitizer. Sorry about that technical glitch. So <laughs> now you're gonna to wanna to attach the site gauge to the conical drain port and carefully run off the gritty low cone yeast to the drain. So here I'm just showing the gritty shrub laden yeast in the bottom, the beer in the top and the creamy smooth middle. You'll know when you've reached the sweet spot as you're draining it off, when you come to a cream colored, smooth and silky yeast. And at that point, you should immediately valve off the drain port. So now you're ready to actually start your harvest. You wanna attach the drought hose and the gas hose to the sanitized keg port. And your setup should look something like this. Have our site gauge attached to the drain port of the fermenter we're harvesting from. We have our drought line coming into our keg through the dip tube. That's where the yeast is coming in. And then we have our pressure relief line, which is soaking in a bucket of sanitizer. It's basically acting as pressure relief so you can fill the keg. And here's a tip. If you're gonna pitch by weight, which I'm gonna cover in a minute, now's the time to place your brink on a floor scale and tear it or zero it. So after you're finished harvesting the slurry into your keg, you can mark the brink with the final weight of the slurry, which you'll use to repitch later. All right, to start harvesting, you just open the drain port and start to fill the brink. Keep a close eye on the site gauge. When you're harvesting the right yeast, you're gonna see this like nice creamy goodness. When it's starting to break, you're gonna see pulses or slugs of yeast coming through with more clear beer. This is a sign that it's almost over. And then finally, when it breaks to clear beer, of course, you're not gonna, you're, you're gonna valve it off and stop harvesting. So here's some tips. When you're harvesting a flocculent strain, a lot of brewers will pressurize the tank. Uh, you wanna pressurize it lightly, maybe from five to 10 PSI. And you need to be careful about tunneling, which is where you'll actually punch a hole with the pressure through the yeast slurry in the cone and start to flood clear beer into your brink, even though it's uh, still got slurry. Another tip, most brewers will 
what, once they see that kind of pulsing and slugging towards the near end of it breaking for the first time, they'll valve off the drain port and they'll wait for about 30 minutes. And what's happening during that time is you're having your yeast settle down the cone. And then when you open up the port again, you harvest even more yeast. And uh, this often results in a larger harvest. And then finally, this will become obvious, but you'll know when a brink is full because the slurry will start to exit from the gas line. Obviously, uh, your keg is stainless steel. You can't see in there. And if you haven't hooked up a sight gauge, which why would you? Then uh, this is how you're going to know when it's full and it's time to move to another keg. Storage is sweet and simple. Store your yeast at 38 and don't let it warm up until you're ready to repitch it. It's a good practice to not allow your yeast to build pressure during storage. Uh, I know a lot of successful brewers who don't do this, but it's simple to either have a PRV, a pressure release valve that will pop at 15 PSI, or a good alternative, and it's simple, is just to leave the gas line attached when you move it into your cellar or your cold room and place the end in a bucket of sanitizer. That way the yeast can blow off as it produces CO2. Uh, the one caveat to that last method is make sure if your yeast is going into the cold room, if it's warm, you leave that blow off arm out of the sanitizer for a little bit while it cools down. Otherwise, as it cools, it can actually suck up the sanitizer into your slurry, which is not good. And then we're talking about timing here. Obviously, the sooner you pitch your yeast, the better. We've done a lot of testing in breweries, and we found pitching within a week of harvest is the best. Um, after three weeks, we see a precipitous drop in most brewers' yeast, and the activity is often poor. It doesn't mean it can't be done in an emergency, but uh, you're really better off pitching it as soon as possible within a week. And after three weeks, if you, if you can avoid it, don't pitch it. All right, so now it's time to repitch. We've uh, harvested our yeast, we've stored it properly, and now we're going to put it back into a new beer. So obviously, you want to remove the brink uh, from your cellar and allow it to come up to room temperature. So to pitch after your work transfer, you want to pressurize the gas line with clean CO2 and attach the drought line with the site gauge back to the drain port or maybe to a sample port. And you can just see here, we're running the process in reverse. We have pressure coming in and slurry coming out. If you want to pitch in line during transfer, which uh, I think is it mostly only important if you're brewing with 20 barrel fermenters or larger because of the mixing, you want to attach a drought line to a T with a sight gauge just downstream of your heat exchanger. You can pressurize it and push it in as soon as the transfer is at the right temperature. Just make sure to have a valve downstream of that uh, sight gauge so you can cut it off when the time comes. So how do you know how much yeast to pitch? Uh, there's a lot of answers to this question, and uh, I'm going to give you a few simple guidelines, starting from the very easiest all the way up to the most complicated. No matter what you do, you want to take guidelines like this, and you want to adjust your pitch rate up and down until you have a robust fermentation and your beer profile is right where you want it. Just find a method that works. Once it's working, stick with it. So the guidelines we've developed here are just based on the fact that your average yeast slurry coming out of a conical fermenter in a brewery is one to two billion cells per mil, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little less. And ideally, the yeast should be greater than 90% viable. 
The simplest way to do it is just pitch by volume. You know, I got a sixth there. It's five gallons, right? And uh, here's some good guidelines to get you started if you're going to pitch by volume. If you fill uh, a keg to volume and don't weigh it, for beers up to a 17 Plato beer, you're looking at about 0.3 to a half a gallon per barrel of work. So a 10 barrel pitch would, or 10 barrels of wort would take about three to five gallons. If your beer is over 17 Plato's, you should go more like 0.6 to 0.8 gallons per barrel. There's disadvantages to everything. Uh, one disadvantage to pitching by volume is that depending on the beer and the yeast, your slurry could have a high percentage of CO2 in it, which means five gallons in volume is not always the same because it could be half CO2 or a tenth CO2. The other disadvantage is that, of course, you're not actually directly measuring viability or your cell density. A better alternative is to pitch by weight. So for beers up to 17 Plato, we recommend you pitch about two and a half to four and a half pounds of yeast per barrel of wort. Uh, that would be in a 10 barrel batch of wort, you would use 26 to 44 pounds. And for beers over 17 Plato, we would go 5.3 to seven pounds per barrel. The good thing about this is since you're weighing the yeast, it avoids the problem of uh, CO2 content in the slurry. The only disadvantage of this method is that you're not actually enumerating the yeast, counting the cell density, or looking at the viability directly. And then finally, we have pitching by cell number. So this method requires you to actually estimate the yeast cell concentration using a hemocytometer usually. Um, and just using the George Fix uh, numbers, you could be looking at doing 1.2 to 1.5 trillion yeast per barrel of wort for a beer below 17 Plato. The disadvantages are uh, a lot of people get by just fine pitching by volume or weight, and uh, it's more time intensive. It requires a microscope and a hemocytometer and the skills to use them. So I just want to summarize here, you know, all the methods we've discussed here have been shown to work well for many breweries. So if you're just getting started, I would recommend adopting one of them. That being said, so have a lot of other methods. I'm a big believer in do no harm. If you have a coworker or know a brewer that's doing something different and it's working well and you try it, then of course it works. There's a lot of ways uh, to skin this cat. And then finally, I would encourage any new brewers to actually experiment, you know, within the range of your budget, your time, your workforce and capability. But once you find something, whether it's, you know, at the more primitive end of the spectrum or all the way up to a very expensive end, once you find something that works, stick with it till you change it. And thank you very much. And I want to put out a special thank you to our friends at Alpha Acid Brewing who let us come in there and uh, get in their way while we took pictures of them harvesting yeast, especially the Kyle, the owner, and uh, Matt here, who's the one that does all the work there. Thank you very much.